Thank you. So really nice to be here talking about some devices and in the afternoon most common arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, some key ECGs, what the non-electrophysiologist needs to know. So problem is sudden cardiac death. Big problem, hard to avoid. You have to add up all the deaths from cancers to get the same number of people who die suddenly from ventricular fibrillation. One of the great problems of clinical medicine. And one of the great discoveries of medicine, Nobel Prize winning defibrillator. Defibrillator implanted, automatic, able to recognize malignant arrhythmia and revive the patient with a shock. The construct is very simple. It's implanted, continuous monitoring, recognize, and it should be able to recognize almost always a rapid, malignant, life-threatening arrhythmia, delivers energy. Patient feels it painful, but almost always successful in eliminating the arrhythmia and restoring normal rhythm. So construct is pretty simple, but there are many things that a non-electrophysiologist should be familiar with, some of the nuances and management issues in your patients with defibrillators. Does it work? One of the early shift studies, things that changed our thinking was yes. This was a selected patient population, <coughs> lucky enough to survive a malignant arrhythmia event, resuscitated, <coughs> came to life, and then the benefit of a defibrillator in preventing subsequent risk of dying was better than an antiarrhythmic. In this early study, it was amiodarone. But that's a very small part of the puzzle. So it's a small number of patients worldwide who actually survive a malignant arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation. And of those who survive, it's a small percentage who really have a normal life. The real challenge, and this remains an unmet challenge today, but was recognized very early after the first proof of concept with defibrillators, is primary prevention. Trying to prevent sudden death before it happens, and it becomes all about risk stratification. Now, one of the truths about risk stratification is that increasing number of studies that were done in the early days clearly recognized high-risk populations. And that's really the mainstay of our practice today, putting in defibrillators in patients who are at high risk. But all of you should remember that those recognized high-risk patients, low ventricular function that's known, myocardial infarction that's known, is a very small percentage of the patients who die suddenly. If you take a look at the United States, about 300,000 sudden deaths, known identifiable risk factors that you can intervene with primary prevention, about 30,000 of them. So about a tenth of the patients who die suddenly. Now, how effective are defibrillators? This was a doubt in the early days. Today, we don't question this in most patient populations. And that was a result of a study, the MADIT-2 study, that looked at patients who had an infarction, scar, and ventricular dysfunction. And this showed that there was clear benefit compared to not doing anything beyond conventional therapy with the defibrillator. There were some issues of the defibrillator itself, complications, issues related to ventricular function that have become less of an issue today. But this gave us the overall paradigm of risk stratification was the main issue was ventricular dysfunction. Till today, this becomes the main screening tool. Ventricular dysfunction, with or without heart failure, with or without a myocardial infarction, become our patients that we recognize that the risk is high enough to die suddenly 
and we have evidence to support placing a defibrillator to reduce that risk of sudden death. Now, the study that kind of brought to light that you don't really need a scar, a defined scar in the heart, was the second great study of ICD therapy, part of our thinking today as clinicians. And this is the SCUD heft study. This was a heart failure population. Don't have to have an infarction. They could, ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, but gave us the story that it's all about ventricular function. In this particular study, it was heart failure symptomatic with ventricular dysfunction and there was a clear benefit of placing a defibrillator uh, when compared to conventional therapy or conventional therapy with amiodarone. Now, the economic societal impact, early on there were some doubts, you know, is this worth it? This is an expensive therapy. But if you look at these defined patient populations where the early studies showed we put a defibrillator, it was highly favorable in terms of therapy needed for life saved compared to many drugs and other screening procedures that we do generally in internal medicine. One of the things that stood the test of time is ventricular function measured with an echocardiogram. Now this surprises a lot of people even today all the vagaries of t checking for ventricular function, the variation from day to day that there could be observer to observer, but it is a remaining powerful tool. And it's very hard to risk stratify beyond ventricular function. I'll point out a few things that appear to be helpful as well. One second story about risk stratification is QRS duration. And you'll see this in a multiple areas of cardiac electrophysiology. In some ways, the QRS duration and then some added features of type or cause of that increased QRS duration is much like ventricular function. It has a whole bunch of causes, but it does tell us about the electrical substrate. So next to ventricular function, the thing to keep an eye out for is QRS duration. Higher it is, longer it is, the more likely that an arrhythmia that the patient has, the likelihood that they will have a malignant arrhythmia. But clearly, you'd guess we need something better than that because we really want to prevent that death in the father, mother playing basketball with their child all of a sudden goes down, can't be resuscitated, and dies. Had no clue that this was coming in. Screening tools, and this has been a hunt forever. Even predating the data on ventricular function, there's got to be something. Autonomic tone, heart rate variability, types of electrocardiography. But unfortunately, they haven't been reliable enough, either because of technical issues with the tests, widespread applicability, ability to scale the test, or just that once you have the ventricular function, it's hard to show anything a little better. So then the next question that comes up is, why not screen everybody to find out who has asymptomatic ventricular dysfunction? And some small pockets worldwide have taken this approach. But it's not cost effective, and it also leads to a lot of testing. And we're also in non-study areas. Is there something fundamentally different about the patient who presents to a physician and finds ventricular dysfunction or just happens to have ventricular dysfunction? One of the new entrants is the savior of all mankind, artificial intelligence, so machine learning. And machine learning taking a single lead electrocardiogram recording, or in some one of the earlier studies, a 12 lead electrocardiogram. And simply after being taught which ECGs correlate with ventricular dysfunction, does a tremendous job 
of trying to pick up who are the patients who have ventricular dysfunction. And this is a source raw material that will drive the engine of new studies to see is this something that you can do, scale, because anybody can pretty much get a single lead ECG and find out if that ventricular dysfunction that's predicted and diagnosed is a marker that we can think about intervention for. Even more remarkable is when the machine learning algorithm tells you there's ventricular dysfunction and the echocardiogram says, nope, you're wrong, check back in a year, guess what? There's ventricular dysfunction. So as with much of machine learning, hard to know what the algorithm is looking at, but it is a new entrant into this era of risk stratification. Now why not just put defibrillators in everybody, all of us here in the room, since if we're lucky to live long enough, we'll die from ventricular fibrillation. So the problem is it's not a perfect tool, it's an expensive tool. The weak link of defibrillators and what you should advise patients about and you'll have to deal with is issues with the lead that give inappropriate messages and decisions from the defibrillator, giving rise to inappropriate shocks and occasionally shocks that won't work. Other issues, common thing like a PFO, patent foramen ovale, one in five, one in four patients, you put in a lead, leads attract thrombus. And some studies, all retrospective thus far, that show that in these patients, the likelihood, despite correcting for atrial fibrillation, anticoagulant, antiplatelet therapy, it is a higher risk of stroke or TIA in those patients. You heard a little bit in the prior talks, one way around this is the subcutaneous ICD, no lead, nothing that you have in the vasculature to form a clot. But also, like you heard in the discussion with long QT syndrome, still haven't figured out a good, reliable way to painlessly pace with a subcutaneous defibrillator. Very close with some variants that have a lead just underneath the sternum, but as of now, there is no good, reliable way to painlessly pace a patient other than having a lead or at least an electrode that's within the heart. A lead in to the talk uh, this afternoon on why we focus for the clinician on recognizing ventricular tachycardia, ablation for ventricular tachycardia, drug treatment for ventricular tachycardia. And the reason is ICDs do not prevent VT or VF. They are an insurance policy and after the fact, painful therapy. And if any of you have handled patients who've had multiple frequent shocks, they're never the same. It's a life and mind changing event. Frequent shocks, painful, fearful, depression, anxiety. And when you have a patient that you're called about in the emergency room having shocks, the main thought process and reason for interrogating the device is you have to figure out what do I need to do? Do I have to stop the arrhythmia or do I need to stop the device? Is it appropriate or is it inappropriate? And the way interrogating the device works is you look for something like this, non-physiological <laughs> signals. Don't look like VT, don't look like ventricular fibrillation. External noise, electromagnetic interference, lead fractures with the wires rubbing against each other and producing electrical noise. In those situations, we stop the device, change the leads, figure out what the external noise is like. On the other hand, if it is an appropriate therapy, device doing what it should do, then we start thinking about some of the things we'll talk about this afternoon, that is ablation, drugs, ways to try to minimize the number of shocks the patient will have. Now sometimes, even with the defibrillator 
treating an appropriate arrhythmia, it may need more than one shock. Part of it has to do with the mechanism of arrhythmia. Part of it is the shock only works if that muscle that's responsible for the arrhythmia, usually regions of the left ventricle, are within the vector, within the field where the shock is being applied. And sometimes these critical areas that need to be shocked may be in some nook or cranny of the ventricle and it doesn't work the first time around and multiple shocks are required. So question then becomes, can you terminate these arrhythmias without shocks and how does that work? And the answer is yes, very important to explain this to your patients. Once you're done telling them about what to do if they feel a painful shock, should also be aware that arrhythmia may be terminated without a shock and that is anti-tachycardia pacing. So usually effective for relatively slow ventricular tachycardias, sometimes rapid arrhythmias as well. Pacing, stimulating and capture at a rate faster than the tachycardia can terminate this arrhythmia. How does this work? Well, what most of our ventricular tachycardias are relatively small circuits hiding somewhere within diseased myocardium that's still living but highly diseased and conducting slow enough to maintain a circuit. And the idea is to pace to try to get into that circuit. And it is a kind of a race. We're not going to make it all the time. And that's why sometimes if a tachycardia is relatively well tolerated, you may need to tell the patient that they may have a string of attempts of anti tachycardia pacing before they will get a shock. And what's happening there is this idea of an excitable gap. This dog chasing its tail in this circuit has got a little bit of a gap between the tail and the dog's mouth. That's what we're trying to get into. It's excitable tissue that we try to get into and when you get into with pacing, it's possible to terminate that tachycardia. So it is kind of an issue of critical timing and sometimes programming the right type of anti-tachycardia pacing will be able to get us into that circuit. Now, the second major change last 20, 25 years in terms of cardiac devices is the concept of physiological pacing. You heard a little bit about it earlier today, about one variant, conduction system pacing. I'll focus on cardiac resynchronization therapy, what you need to understand, what you need to convey to your patients, and some simple things in follow-up that you should look at and alert yourself to when intervention and optimization is needed. The construct is pretty straightforward. Normal ventricular contraction is a really well-coordinated, synchronized phenomenon. And the idea is, when there's cardiac disease, is it possible by placing leads, right ventricle, strategic locations in the left ventricle, despite the disease, despite scars, despite issues in the conduction system, can we get close to that normal function? The answer in terms of does it help was extraordinary. Unlike anything else in our field of electrophysiology, from the time of construct to when a body of evidence that prospective studies showed that there is important improvement in quality of life was relatively quick. By the way, we're still trying to do that with atrial fibrillation or any kind of ablation. But don't tell your local electrophysiologist I told you that. But since it works, we've got to have some idea how it's supposed to work so we understand why it doesn't work sometimes, maybe 40% of the time. The idea is that if you have an issue like left bundle branch block, the way the left ventricle gets activated is passively through myocardium, 
may be getting into bits of the conduction system, but from the right ventricle. <coughs> so as a result, we have late activation of portions of the left ventricle. It's so late, they may even be contracting while the aortic valve is closing or closed. So it's wasted myocardial energy trying to contract when it cannot effectively contribute to cardiac output. The aim of the game is to try to recruit that muscle and make it contract a little bit earlier. Now, a couple of things to note is when we have scars, a common misconception is somehow putting a pacemaker lead can make dead tissue come to life. Not happening. The idea is that this dead tissue is acting like a conduction block. So even if the conduction system is reasonably OK, it will still produce downstream late activation. And that late activation, the part that's late, if we can stick a lead there, then we can coordinate that a little quicker with the rest of the heart. Now, you can see here, same patient, but dilated cardiomyopathy. You see this little dance that the left ventricle is doing? Imagine yourself to be a blood cell in that patient's left ventricle. It's like table tennis. You're just going septum free wall, septum free wall. And the idea is, if we do get a lead, then we're not going to make it normal most of the time. There is such a thing as a super responder. But whatever is available, we're trying to get it to work together. Septum and free wall. Not so much RV and LV, but septum and free wall of the left ventricle. How do we do that? Still today, we avoid putting leads endocardially inside the left ventricle. It is possible, and there's some variance of trying to do that. But the vast majority of resynchronization is done through the cardiac venous system. So what to expect in this procedure? Patient tells you, you know, you sent me to this doc, and it took five hours to get this wire in. <laughs> uh, tell him it's easy. The way it's done is like putting standard pacemaker leads, but the coronary sinus, which is just behind the tricuspid valve, it's located maybe with a roving catheter, maybe with some dye, a wire. And then a sheath is just placed inside to gain access to the coronary sinus. It's clear that it's not enough just to put a lead in the venous system. We want it on the lateral wall. Most patients, we want it on the lateral wall, preferably not too close to the apex, not too close to the base, somewhere in the middle. And most of the time, with taking some time and some effort, it is possible to do that with a lead. And we try to keep it stable there and uh, prevent the need for redoing the procedure. What do you need to keep in mind about resynchronization therapy? The heart has to pace for resynchronization therapy to work. You put in these beautiful leads, perfect position, and if it doesn't pace, it's a placebo. Why won't it pace? Number one reason is atrial fibrillation. So if you have a patient who has atrial fibrillation, if their rates are fast, then the pacemaker is inhibited. It's not going to pace. And they'll be living with their dyssynchronous inherent conduction. So key in that patient population is to control rates. That could be with the same drugs you're using for heart failure, beta blockers. But sometimes it may take something like either primary ablation for atrial fibrillation or AV node ablation to maximize the chance of having what we believe is better for the heart, that is resynchronization therapy. Here we meet QRS with the GIN. In terms of who benefits the most, it is patients with ventricular dysfunction, the main group of patients we're placing the device in. But if you look in that spectrum of patients, many studies strongly suggest the wider the QRS to begin with, 
the more likely that there's dyssynchrony, the more likely that that dyssynchrony may be benefited with cardiac resynchronization. <coughs> Electrocardiogram to imprint in your minds. Every single patient who has a CRT device and comes to you for follow-up should have an electrocardiogram that looks something like this, maybe exactly like this. And if it doesn't, telephone your friendly neighborhood electrophysiologist and tell them you messed up. You need to do something a little bit better. So what is it about this electrocardiogram? So there's many things, but if you're like anything like our own fellows, you like shortcuts, so I'll give you a shortcut. One lead, one lead. The golden lead of CRT, lead one, lead one. Lead one is a lead that's close to the left shoulder. If lead one is negative, that means activation is starting near the left shoulder. That's what you want. The part of the heart closest to the left shoulder is the free wall of the left ventricle. Lead one should be negative if all is well with cardiac resynchronization. Left ventricle lead is working well, and the left ventricular lead has enough of a chance to activate the heart compared to the right ventricular lead. What do I mean by enough of a chance? If you pace the right ventricle, the lead in the right ventricle is closest to lead V1, your right-sided lead. V1 will be negative, left bundle branch block pattern. If you pace the left ventricle, then lead one is the closest to that lead, and that should be negative. Sort of mirror images of each other. It follows that if you're pacing from both, you should have some kind of a hybrid pattern. Somewhat looking like this, somewhat looking like that, but still clear evidence of left ventricular activation. But look, pacing both looks an awful lot like right ventricular pacing alone. So when you make that phone call, you say, look, it's not working, the left ventricular lead. Then you rush the patient to get tested, and the left ventricular lead is capturing just fine. Before you die of embarrassment, there's a reason why this happens. The lead may work fine solo, but there's so much disease around that area where the lead was placed, it takes too long to sneak out to the rest of the ventricle, and the right ventricular pacing lead wins. Sometimes the best fix is to revise the lead, but sometimes you can just give a little head start to the left ventricular lead. Make it pace a little earlier. It's not a great solution, but worth trying to see if you get the right vector, the right amount of synchrony to make them both together. Why doesn't this work in everyone? Well, several reasons. First thing to remember is in the normal heart activation is extremely complicated. This is derived from an actual recordings in human uh, tissue. Uh, if you notice, the endocardial surface gets activated a little bit before, I'll play it again. The endocardial surface gets activated a little before the epicardial surface, and there's a lag between the endocardial and epicardial activation sequences. Why all these gimmicks? The reason is this is what's necessary to produce the normal twist and squeeze of ventricular activation. It's highly coordinated. It's different in different portions of the heart. To say we've normalized by just sticking one lead somewhere in the epicardial surface, it's a stretch. So it's the idea is to improve, not to cure. The idea in some patients may be to just prevent worsening by trying to recruit whatever available myocardium we have. Now, some newer types of trying to do this, you know, conduction system, trying endocardial pacing, multiple sites that have a little lag from each electrode, <coughs> try to get closer and closer 
to get to what's normal, similar to the conduction system, apex to base, endocardium a little, twisting type motion. And some experimental systems in actually can try and produce something very similar to a squeeze. But till today, though, what we put in on our patients is a far cry from this and managing expectations. Your own, when you're describing this therapy to patients, encouraging them to do it, and the patient's expectations, what to think about how much of a benefit would be considered success, that's the backdrop to keep in mind. So to summarize ICD, remember it's insurance, it's painful, and our job is after placing it, making sure we're doing everything possible to minimize the need for therapy, treating the heart failure, managing coronary disease, and as we'll talk later, appropriate moments for ablation or medical therapy. Resynchronization therapy, heart failure, ventricular dysfunction, wide QRS, wider the QRS, more likely to get the benefit, the construct, why we try to get, and expectations from that therapy. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.